In recent years, we've seen a rise in the fight for women's equality, but even our newest fourth wave of feminism misses the mark for a huge swath of women. Today, I'll take you through a brief history of feminism, and we'll talk about some books that may help us to better understand whose voices still aren't being heard. Let's get into it. Let's start with what feminism even really is. And this is one of those terms that can mean so many different things to so many different people, depending on who you ask and what their life experiences and current worldviews are. Some define it simply as all genders having equal rights to opportunities and other argues that society prioritizes the male point of view and that women are treated unjustly in those societies. Early feminism takes us back to 375 BCE when the Greek philosopher Plato authored The Republic. He argued for the total political and sexual equality of women, advocating that they be members of his highest class, those who rule and fight. Moving quite a bit along to the 7th or 8th century, depending on who you ask, there was Andal, the only female poet saint out of the 12 Alvars of South India. Her divine marriage to Vishnu is viewed by some as a feminist act, since it allowed her to avoid the regular duties of being a wife and allowed her to gain some autonomy. Christine de Pezon was a poet and court writer for King Charles the six of France and several French dukes. In 1390, following the death of her husband, she began writing for wealthy clients in an effort to support herself and her children. Her works, which includes novels, poetry, and biography, were considered to be some of the earliest feminist writings, and she later went on to write literary, historical, philosophical, political, and religious reviews and analyses. She's stated to be the first woman to denounce misogyny and write about the relation of the sexes, and the Book of the City of Ladies is one of her most popular works. In the 17th century, Margaret Fell, also known as the mother of Quakerism, produced her most famous work, Women Speaking Justified. It was a scripture-based argument for women's ministry and one of the major texts on women's religious leadership in the 17th century. She based her argument for equality of the sexes on one of the basic premises of Quakerism, which was spiritual equality. Her belief was that God created all human beings, therefore both men and women were capable not only of possessing the inner light, but also the ability to be a prophet. The Enlightenment marked the rise of philosophical writing and many philosophers during that time period defended the rights of women, like Jeremy Bentham. He said it was the placing of women in a legally inferior position that made him choose the career of a reformist at the age of 11. Before dying, he laid out some very specific instructions for what should be done with his body, including the mummification of his severed head, which is an image that lives rent-free in my brain and now in yours too. In the 19th century, we started to see the feminine ideal begin to take hold. There was widespread acceptance of the Victorian image of women's proper role. It created a dichotomy of separate spheres for men and women, where men occupy the public sphere, think wage labor and politics, and women the private one, the space of the home and children. This feminine ideal was typified in conduct books like Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management, which I hate to say has a really cool cover. Fuck, wait, is this how they suck women in? We saw an increase in feminism in fiction with writers like Jane Austen focusing on women's restricted lives, and writers like Elizabeth Glasgow and George Eliot depicting women's misery and frustration. Before publishing Little Women, Louisa May Alcott wrote a strongly feminist novel called A Long Fatal Love Chase. The book is about a young woman's attempts to flee her bigamous husband and become independent and was published 107 years after Alcott died. Moving outside of literature, in the 1850s, Florence Nightingale, an English social reformer and statistician, became the founder of modern nursing. She became prominent while serving as a manager and trainer of nurses during the Crimean War, where she significantly reduced death rates by improving hygiene and living standards. In the 19th and 20th centuries is when we start to refer to waves of feminism. The first wave may look familiar to you. It was the West's first sustained political movement dedicated to achieving political equality for women, the suffragettes. That started in about 1848. First waivers would march, 
lecture, and protest, and they would face arrest, ridicule, and violence as they fought tooth and nail for the right to vote. One piece that I feel isn't often spoken about is the fact that this movement was firmly integrated with the abolitionist movement. The leaders were all abolitionists. Think folks like Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Maria Stewart, and Francis E. W. Harper. Despite all the work that Black women did for this movement, it eventually established itself as a movement specifically for white women and used racial tensions as fuel for its work. Black women were barred from some of the demonstrations or they were forced to walk behind the white women and others. And when the 15th Amendment was passed in 1870, granting Black men the right to vote, all hell broke loose. You better believe more white women got a fire lit under their asses to fight for the right to vote because, as one white woman put it, if educated women are not as fit to decide who shall be the rulers of this country as field hands, then what's the use of culture or any brain at all? Yep, she really said that. The 19th Amendment was finally passed in 1920, granting women the right to vote, but it still remained difficult for Black women to vote, especially in the South. Starting in about 1963, second wave feminism broadened the debate to include a wider range of issues like sexuality, family, domesticity, the workplace, and reproductive rights. It also drew attention to the issues of domestic violence and marital rape, created rape crisis centers and women's shelters, and brought about changes in custody laws and divorce law. Feminists owned bookstores, credit unions, and restaurants were among the key meeting spaces and economic engines of the movement. Movement. The movement won some major legislative and legal victories. The Equal Pay Act of 1963 theoretically outlawed the gender pay gap. A series of landmark Supreme Court cases through the 60s and 70s gave married and unmarried women the right to use birth control. Title IX gave women the right to educational equality. And in 1973, Roe v. Wade guaranteed women reproductive freedom. So with the second wave of feminism at its height, it's clear to see how it was radical enough to scare people. Hence the myth of bra burners. That's right, myth. Despite the popular story, there was no mass burning of bras among second wave feminists. The third wave is one that's hard to talk about with any clarity because so few people agree on what it is and when it started, but generally it comes down to two things. The Anita Hill case in 1991 and the emergence of riot girl groups in the music scene of the early 1990s. In 1991, Anita Hill testified that Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas had sexually harassed her at work. Thomas made it into the Supreme Court anyway, but Hill's testimony sparked an avalanche of sexual harassment complaints. Very similar to the way Harvey Weinstein accusations were followed by a litany of sexual misconduct accusations against other powerful men. Riot Girl was the feminist punk subculture that emerged in the early 1990s in Olympia, Washington. The triple R in girl was intended to reclaim the word girl for women. What's interesting here is that the third wave embraced all kinds of ideas and language and aesthetics that the second wave had worked to reject. Makeup and high heels and high femme girliness. The movement created zines and art talked about rape, patriarchy, sexuality, and female empowerment. The third wave was a diffuse movement without a central goal, so there's no single piece of legislation or major social change here like with the first or second wave. And the fourth wave of feminism might be here today, with Me Too, Time's Up, and women's marches, and record numbers of women running for public office, we're entering a time that just feels different. Women are speaking up and sharing their experiences online about sexual abuse, sexual harassment, sexual violence, the objectification of women, and sexism in the workplace, so the internet is playing a massive role in this wave as well. As always, there's so much more nuance and detail to all of this, but if you've gotten any value from this so far, drop this video a like. A lot of what we've spoken about, that white mainstream feminism, has become the represented type of feminism today, and most people think of that as feminism. And this ignores the fact that a large number of women of color have transformed the nature of feminism, and one of the key tenets of the modern day movement is intersectionality. This is an issue of gender, but it's also largely an issue of race and class. Any feminism that privileges those that already have privilege is bound to be irrelevant to poor women, working class women, women of color, trans women, trans women of color. And this leads me to our book recommendation. Yes, recommendation, singular, because I feel like there's really only one book that you need to read to better understand what I'm getting at here. It's
It's Hood Feminism by Mickey Kendall. The book uses autobiography and black feminist theory to explain that feminism has long marginalized the experiences of black women, especially ones from under-resourced communities, i.e. the hood. It argues that feminism in the hood is more about survival and less about becoming the next CEO. It's about being able to afford your house, or actually stay home from work if you're sick and be able to feed your kids while doing so. Kendall states that if we make sure that the people who are in the margins are centered in our work and address Maslow's hierarchy of needs, housing, food, healthcare, and access to education, et cetera, that we would be a lot better off. If we're going to do feminism for all women, then we need to make sure that the poorest women have everything they need to survive. And that mainstream feminism shuts out a lot of women from the march towards equality because it doesn't represent the things that really matter. The book is told through essays from Kendall's personal life, and she uses historical and pop culture references to further illustrate her points. Over 18 chapters, she touches on topics like how gun violence is a feminist issue because it has a disproportionate impact on black women and girls, how hunger and food insecurity are issues that white feminists have ignored due to class differences. And my personal favorite, the fetishization of fierce, where Kendall discovers that the concept of fierceness supports cultural stereotypes of women of color as strong and that they don't need or deserve help from white feminists. The book is thoughtful, intelligent, and insightful. And as a black woman, I had my own views of modern day feminism, but this book opened me up to new perspectives and lenses to look through that I would not previously considered. If we want all women to do better, if we want a movement that is for all women, then we need to meet the needs of every woman as best as we can. Mainstream feminism can expand its current sphere, and not only is it possible, but right now it is incredibly necessary.